Let's continue our investigation of these functions delta sub h of t. I've reproduced the uh, definition here. We looked at these in the last video. And what I'd like to do is let's take a moment um, and let's think about uh, what delta sub h of t minus c is. Now we discussed this in the last video. We're taking c to be greater than zero. So what this is is actually just the same function but shifted to the right. Uh, so that it's centered at c. So what we have is the function value is still 1 over 2h, but now, rather than having that value between negative h and h, in other words, within h of t, it needs to have that value within h of the number c. So if we think of within h of c means h minus c to h plus c, so that gives us our range of values um, over which the function takes the value. Whoops, that's supposed to be c minus h rather than h minus c. Let's fix that. So from c minus h to c plus h, the function has the value 1 over 2h. And it's 0 otherwise. So in this video, I want to look at a couple things. First of all, um, we're interested in what the integral of this delta function is. If we just plop it out somewhere um, on the interval from 0 to infinity, which is the interval we're interested in when we're doing a Laplace transform. So let's take a look. We have the integral from 0 to infinity of delta sub h of t minus c. Uh, dt. What we're going to assume is that uh, c is large enough and h is small enough so that uh, this quantity c minus h is, is greater than or equal to zero. And if that's the case, then um, because this function is zero everywhere except between c minus h and c plus h, what we really have is the integral from c minus h to c plus h. And in between those two values, the, the value of the function is 1 over 2h. So this is what our integral turns out to be. And of course, the 1 over 2h is simply a constant, so we can bring it out in front. So we have 1 over 2h times the integral from c minus h to c plus h uh, dt. And of course, the integral of dt, sorry about all this crazy moving, okay, the integral of dt is simply t, so this, is, this turns out to be um, 1 over 2h times the quantity c plus h minus the quantity c minus h. And if you think through the arithmetic there a little bit, we have 1 over 2h, and then there's, there's going to be a c minus a c, which will be 0, and then h minus negative h, so times 2h, which of course then the 2h's cancel and we just get 1. So that's regardless of the value of uh, h and c. Now that, if we think about it, that really should make sense geometrically. Uh, what we have is... Um, we have our function somewhere like this. So it's 0 up to some point, and then it's greater than 0, and then it's 0 again. So this, this height here on the, uh, on the y-axis is 1 over 2h. And uh, this distance, though, here turns out to be 2h. So all this integral is really showing us is that area, uh, that being the area underneath this thing right here, area is just length times width, and 1 over 2h times h is 1. What we want to look at next is uh, what happens when we calculate an integral like this. So if we do an integral from 0 to infinity of some function f of t, times delta sub h 
of t minus c dt, um, what happens in this case? So let's shrink that down a little bit and come back to it. So if we think about it, this delta sub h is simply, remember it's 1 over 2h from uh, c minus h to c plus h, and it's 0 el everywhere else. Okay, so 0 elsewhere. So when we compute this integral, um, we're really multiplying f of t times 0, except everywhere between c minus h and c plus h. So the integral then becomes um, an integral from c minus h to c plus h. We still have our function f of t. But between c minus h and c plus h, the value of the uh, delta sub h of t minus c is simply 1 over 2h, which is, of course, a constant. So let's see if we can move. Darn, I'm not going to be able to do that. So let's leave it as it is. Let's put a 1 over 2h in here, um, dt. Okay. So then we can just pull the constant, the 1 over 2h, outside of the integral and do an integral from c minus h to c plus h of f of t dt. Now it turns out you may or may not recognize this. The, uh, the length of the interval over which we're integrating is 2h. And when we integrate a function over an interval and then divide by the length of the interval, we're actually finding uh, the average value of the function. So this is the average value of f um, on the interval from c minus h to c plus h. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what we're computing when we do this. And let's take a look at what happens when we do this uh, for some specific function and a few particular values of h. So uh, what I want to look at is let's suppose that f of t is t squared and we're going to do a lim or an integral so we want to look at the integral from uh, 0 to infinity of t squared uh, times delta sub h of t minus 2 dt. So what we have here is, is um, for various values of h we're going to get different values of this integral and there'll be different averages of the t squared function. So let's, let's start out, um, but we're averaging around the value where t equals 2. So let's start out with um, Oh, let's say first of all that, that h happens to be 1. So when h equals 1, the value of the integral um, turns out to be um, 4.3 repeating. When h is 1 half, which means our interval becomes narrower, uh, the value is 4.083 repeating. And when h is a fourth, the value of the integral is uh, 4.0208 repeating. So you can see that the values appear to be getting closer and closer to 4 and it looks like what we have going on is that the limit as h goes to 0 of the integral from 0 to infinity of t squared delta sub h of t minus c dt is 4. 
And in fact, this is the case. And what we want to notice is that 4 happens to be 2 squared, um, where the significance of the 2, let's see, I made a mistake in there. Uh, this, this was supposed to be a 2 right here. So where I put that black over the blue, that is 2. And so the 2, together with the function t squared, is what's leading us to 2 squared. So when we integrate against one of these delta functions with a translation, uh, we integrate that function times some other function, what we end up getting is the value of our other function um, at that value that, that our delta function is shifted to. So let's, let's conclude that with um, a specific... What we want to do now is um, replace this delta sub h with a different function we're going to call delta, which incorporates the limit uh, that we're seeing right here and behaves in the same way that we've seen. So basically what we're going to have <coughs> is just some function we'll name delta of t. And the thing about this delta is it has this particular property. Uh, it's oftentimes called the sifting property. And, of course, as I mentioned earlier, this isn't a, actually a function, but um, what we have is, uh, we can, we, it, basically this function does what we just saw up above. So, if we had the integral from 0 to infinity of t squared times delta of t minus 2 dt, what this function does is it simply evaluates the function t squared for t equaling 2. So it puts the 2 in there, and that's our result. Okay, so this comes out to be equal to 2 squared, or 4. To look at another example, if we had the integral from 0 to infinity of, say, the square root of t times delta of t minus 9 dt, what we would get from this is simply the square root of 9. So again, what's happening is this is our function, and this is the value that's going into the function. So let's do, let's do one last one of those. Suppose we were looking at the integral from 0 to infinity of sine t. times delta, so let's put parentheses on the sign to not tangle it up with that delta, uh, delta of t minus pi over 2 dt uh, means that we simply evaluate sine at pi over 2, which is 1. So that's the behavior of the delta function um, that we're interested in, the delta quote function. It's not actually a function again. So let's uh, leave that at that for now. And in the next video, we'll, um, we'll consider the Laplace transform of a delta function.